Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Categorically Romance Podcast. My name is Bree, and I am joined today by author Adele Buck. Adele, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much. And we are also joined for the first time ever, audiobook narrator, or audio artist, Monica Plant is here. Monica, thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. I'm, we're so happy you're here. So this is your first time here. Tell us a little bit about you, Monica. Oh boy. <laughs> I was like, how far back do I go? <laughs> I I am an actor. I uh, I have, gosh, 30 plus years of on-camera and theatrical acting experience, ranging from series regular to guest starring TV roles to, you know, theater, award-winning short films and things like that. And now audiobook narration, which I just, I took to it like a fish to water. I just really, really love it so much. I was a literature and acting major in college. So when I sort of discovered it, I thought, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> I can act out books. This is amazing. Uh, so yeah, so this is my new foray. But I am from, I'm born and raised in California. I've lived in Europe. I've traveled a lot. I'm um, really into sports. Uh, I'm a big snowboarder and surfer and things like that. And then also really into like holistic healing. I'm also a certified health and life coach. And I work primarily with creatives, uh, actors, narrators, entrepreneurs, things like that. So I've got my hands in a lot of different things, but this is really where my heart is right now. Oh my God, you are a boss. Like, <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, for so like audiobook, I, mean, I want to get into the like the whole journey into narration, but um, you have are the narrator for Adele, your series, the Center Stage series, correct? Yes, she is. Yes. Okay, so for you, Adele, as like the the author, uh, I know for so many, like the dream is like to have your books on audio, right? So like, how does that feel for you when your books are kind of bought to life in that that aspect, that platform? It's super, super exciting, I have to say. And yes, it is for, for a lot of us, and certainly for me, being a complete fanatic with, with audiobooks, I am rarely between audiobooks, honestly. I've usually got them stacked up waiting to go either from the library or from um or from a, a, a commercial and you know, I bought them or whatever. Uh and so when I got the email that Tantor had offered to buy the audio rights for the center stage series, I was totally thrilled. Uh and then I was kind of like, oh crap, I'm gonna have another actor looking at these things. And while I was an actor when I was in my uh in my my youth and my 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 young adulthood. Uh, it's been many years, and I had researched as much as I could. I still have uh, friends from college who are still very much in the game. So when I was uncertain about, like, for instance, do stage managers still use paper or do they like use an iPad? Uh, you know, I was able to reach out to my former college roommate, who's a who's a Broadway tour stage manager uh, and say, Hey, Megan, uh, can you just, and she's, she's like, yeah, it's about 50, 50. I'm like, Oh good. I could, Cause I know I, I used to, I used to, you know, be a stage manager and I used, I, I knew how to work that world. Uh, you know, and when, when I um, had Alicia in book two go into, you know, go into television, I have another friend from, from prep school who is a casting director. And so I was able to contact her and say, you know, okay, for this kind of role, what kind of trailer would she get? Uh, so that I could at least sort of slightly get those details right. But I, you know, still wasn't quite sure because it had been a few years since I'd written those books. And I was like, I'm not sure if those details still hold up, but okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when I finally met Monica after, I think pretty much after she'd already done all the narration, she's like, I didn't, I didn't sense any mistakes. So I was like, yay. That's awesome. That's awesome. So Monica, you have this this amazing like background and, and acting and all of that. So tell us the journey into the audiobook world. Like how does someone stumble upon that? Well, you know, the interesting thing is I actually, I have some friends who've been doing it for a very long time, actually. And one of my friends was like, hey, you should come to an APA event, which is the Audiobook Publishers Association. And this was in 2018. So before the pandemic, before all of that stuff. And so I went to my first event back then. And I met, you know, 
I met some people from Penguin Random House and a few other of these bigger publishing companies. And then I didn't do anything with it. <laughs> um, it took me a while. And I think the pandemic obviously forced a lot of people, actors especially, into finding other ways to be creative. And this was already sort of in the back of my mind. So I just started exploring it. And I have another friend who has a course called The Great Audiobook Adventure, Elise Arsenault. And so I took her course. And like I said, I had a number of friends who were already doing it. So fortunately, I had some really, really wonderful mentors that pointed me in the right direction. And fortunately, I you know, immediately started working with publishers like Tantor, who published uh, Adele's books. And had some of these fantastic series, you know, like this one. So that's really how it went. I just sort of followed the curriculum, followed the advice of my friends and mentors, and started reaching out to publishers, got my demos done. And it kind of just took off from there. So how, like, coming across, like, Adele series, how does that happen for you? Is is it, hey, guys, we have this series we're doing on audio and we need someone to narr you know both you know, whether it's male and female or someone that can narrate both and is it like an audition thing yes in this case i mean i have fortunately had some books offered to me but this was an audition and so yeah i auditioned for it and hadn't heard anything for quite some time and then you know ended up they wanted me to do another audition uh with like a british accent because in the second book there is a main character who has an accent and so i i submitted that and then I think I didn't hear for quite some time, and correct me if I'm wrong, Adele, but I feel like it took quite some time for me to hear, and all, all of a sudden I was like, oh, oh, I got it. That's amazing. Well, what's interesting, I don't actually, I don't know what the timeline was between you doing the audition tape and it coming to me, because when we got the second, um, the, the, the British uh, version, because, you know, I, I as you know now, there's not only a British main character in book two, but like also his entire family for their destination wedding in book four. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that the person was, you know, truly comfortable with, with the accent. And, uh, but once, I mean, I, we turned around our answer, I think the day we got that second tape. So I don't know how long, you know, how long Tantor took, or, you know, I don't know what the, all the machinations are behind the scenes. Cause that's the thing is that um, it was very much like, and I don't know even if, if there's another layer, because for me, I know there's there's me, there's my agent, my agent talks to Tantor, and then I don't know if Tantor talks to Monica's agent, and then Monica's agent talks to Monica, or if that was a more of a direct <laughs> line. But I think this like this, it felt like there was this very big game of telephone going on until, and I can't remember, uh, Monica, if like we connected on Instagram finally, and I can't recall if you reached out to me in DMs or if I reached out to you, um, but it was finally like, like, okay, we can cut to the chase now. <laughs> exactly. Actually, the I mean, there are some, you know, very well-known narrators that do use agents, but we do not for the most part in audiobooks, which is kind of lovely. Um, mm. I, I talked directly to the publishers. And in this case, I got to know Adele and in a couple of the other cases have had a direct line with the authors as well through social media and other things, which is nice because I know some publishers definitely want you to just go through them, but sometimes it's, I, I really like, I loved having a relationship with Adele where we could just have a conversation and also, you know, hear kind of their thoughts on things too. You know, once it's done, it's done, but to know that they're happy with your work, believe me, it makes you feel really, really great. <laughs> yeah. And to, and to have Monica say that she liked my books, similarly, great, because I mean, I can, I can imagine that there's plenty of times where, you know, a narrator is like, okay, we're going to read this thing that I wouldn't ever sit down and read on a Saturday afternoon, because um, a job's a job, you know? So, yeah. Well, that's what I kind of wanted to ask next for for Monica, like, um, so it, do you re sit down and read the book first yes. and then record? Okay. okay. Yes. Well, now, granted, when we audition for it, we're only given, you know, sometimes we're given the whole book for the prep, but I mean, the, the turnaround for the audition is usually just a couple of days. So you don't really have time to go through the entire book or anything, but usually they'll give you the first chapter or something for you to read from. So you're not necessarily clear on what you're getting into all the time. Yeah. Um, but I really, I read, I loved these books because of how, what they, you know, what, how they represented the acting world too in different areas of the entertainment industry. And Adele just was so spot on with it. 
which is what I yeah, really love. Like I was you like, you two were a match made in heaven. <laughs> yeah, this was really, it was very accurate. And yeah, I just, I loved her writing. It was funny. So there was some good sarcasm, some good humor. The characters I thought were well developed. And, you know, here's the thing there's so much good stuff in romance. And I think romance in general gets a bad rap sort of in the whole world, you know, as being, oh, it's, I don't know, sometimes erotica and things like that. They'll say it's smut, it's this, it's not good writing, but that's so not true. And romance is actually the one of the biggest selling categories in books, you know. Yes, it is. And, yes, it is. and it's the, num- the actual numbers are really hard to find, by the way. And, you know, the Romance Writers of America likes to, to bat around a particular, very old, very unsourced statistic. But yeah, it is a very, it is a very, very big selling genre. Yeah, it's a huge selling genre. And, you know, I think there's so, there's so many great, you know, well-written romance books too. And they really do take you on that adventure. And for women, especially where I think just in, you know, in the world as it is in our society, you know, a lot of the stuff that some of these books help women maybe come into their own for, you know, whether it's their their emotional life, their sexual life, you know, how to relate to partners and things like that. I think a lot of these books explore that and really can help people explore that in their own lives. And I think they're so valuable. And plus, who doesn't love love? I mean, we yeah. all need more love. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't, and I don't know if you guys got a chance to see this, but I, I sent to both of you this morning, there was uh, Tanya Eby had put out a very timely article about how that was ex- narrating romance and erotica help, did help her get in touch with her sexuality and her emotions as, as, a, as, as a person, not just as a narrator. So yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a thing. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, the, the characters can be super multi-layered and complex like we are as humans. And yeah, I haven't read that article, but I love Tanya. She is an amazing narrator. She's also in casting now. She works, she had her own production company for a long time called Blunder Woman. And yeah. now she works with uh, Dion Audio in casting. And so she's, I think she's narrated over a thousand books, half of them probably, you know, romance and erotica. Yeah. And, and she's a sweetheart. Yes. She's just such a lovely shout out, person. Shout out to Tanya Edie, yeah, sweetheart. Shout out to Tanya. Hi, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I kind of wanted to ask, I mean, I feel like you both answered it, uh, you, you both touched on it already, but, you know, oh, there's overarching romance, but like audio books have really taken, I feel like, the world by storm. Now, there are always going to be those people, the, the naysayers or whatever, but I feel like in the world of romance, for the most part, people really love consuming romance on audio. What do you think? I mean, Adele, I'd love to hear you as as the writer and Monica, someone that's like bringing the stories to life. Like, I guess from like, uh, maybe like a little bit of like the business aspect, but just the enjoyment as well. Like, Adele, what do you feel like having not just a physical copy, not just the ebook copy, but now you can experience people can experience your stories through audio? Like, what do you think that helps contribute to the genre. Does that make sense? It does. And it I I'm probably I'm probably going to miss a few things that I would say if if this were a perfect world and um but you know, one of the things it definitely gives is the opportunity for people who have issues with reading uh, physically, uh issues with their vision or 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 sometimes with um, you know, mentally processing language visually. Uh that's a that's a huge thing. Um, and then just, I think there's also, you know, one of the things I miss about acting, and I haven't been an actor for many, many, many years, is the collaborative process of it. And having, you know, I, when I was in college, I actually wrote a short play and, uh, and um, my, some friends of mine uh, did a reading of it. And it was the first time I had ever, I believe, written something, written lines for someone else and had them interpret it. and. I remember that being such a thrill and there's a similar thrill to this is that, you know, people are taking your words and they're making possibly, you know, choices that you would not have made, but are equally um, valid and enjoyable creatively. So those are like the top things I think of off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. What about you, Monica? 
Well, bringing these stories to life, I mean, that what an amazing job. I mean, for real. And I get to do in, audi- in audiobooks what I can't do in, you know, theatrical on camera acting. I get to play all the parts. You know, how fun is that? I get to bring the male characters to life, like characters of all different backgrounds and races. And, and it's just, it's so fun. And I think the biggest thing for me is doing it justice. You know, making sure that, you know, hopefully, even if it is a different choice than, say, the author would have made, that they find it equally intriguing and, you know, honoring of what they've written. And, yeah, it's the most fun bringing this world to life. Mm-hmm. And and hopefully, like I said, doing it justice and, you know, the author doing the author's words justice and bringing them to life. Monica, have you done a co-narrated book yet? I have. Not a duet, but dual. Yes. Yeah, well, m- most of them are dual. D- yeah. The duet process seems very complicated. It would be very complicated. <laughs> I know. I've there's some that I ha- I've purposely not auditioned for because I'm like, oh, that just seems difficult. And I've heard some, and you know, they have to just be edited really, really well for it to sound good. And well, and if it feels like the communication between the two narrators would have to be just absolutely stunning, because I have. I have listened to some howlers. Like there was a a one book that I, I listened to where the um the male lead's name is Lucien and his family is French, right? And the female narrator was calling him Lucian. Oh no. <laughs> and yeah, and so there was this complete disconnect. Yeah. And so obviously these two narrators didn't didn't connect up on well, okay, let's let's get some let's get some some commonality here it was very very jarring yeah um and 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 what and I just wanted to say one of the things that for this particular series when my agent and I were talking about um you know she asked me what my thoughts on narrators should be I said I really think it should that these books need to have a single narrator because the scenes are very short and having having them bop from point of view to point of view with these short scenes I think would be extremely jarring uh, and and wouldn't wouldn't flow very well narratively. So that the dual narration, I don't mind at all. You know, and luckily the 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 ones that I've done, I've had great you know communication with my fellow narrators in talking about obviously pronunciations and things like that. To Adele's point, and uh, and also just the feeling of each character, because obviously my voice, I have a pretty deep raspy voice, but it's still never going to sound like a man's voice, you know, 100%. And so, you know, understanding like where are they putting it in their register to so I can sort of match where they're coming from. But really more than anything, it's the personality that they're infusing the character and just making sure we're on that same same boat, even though our voices are going to sound somewhat different in presenting it. So yeah, this I mean, is when we have like two narrators, right? Is, is there ever a time where you would like be in the studio with the other narrator or is that all separate? No, they do it. I mean, people are back in the studio now. Multicasts, multicast can be both. Um, okay. I have a lot of friend narrator friends who've been in the studio with other cast members in a multicast book, which is amazing because then it is sort of like a theater production. You know, they're all sitting around and they're reading, you know, and acting off each other, which I think is amazing. I have not done that yet. And I think mostly for romance, it's still remote at this point. Um, But there is multicast being done in studio now for sure. Well, I was looking and you have quite a list of accents and dialects that you do. So like American English, Southern, New York, you, and you put various in parentheses, uh, Canadian, French, Spanish, British, uh, Irish, and German. So like how, and I, I know both of you coming from the acting world, I'm assuming this is something that maybe you all perfect, you know, during classes and things like that. But how does learning those different dialects happen it's work. You got to work on them. And I, I work with coaches, too, who, who do those dialects. My very first audiobook, the main character was Irish. <laughs> and I, I already had an Irish accent just from my own acting experience. But I worked with him a number of times just to make sure it was where it needed to be. And even since then, I've listened to it. And I was like, oof, my accent's so much better now, even than when I <laughs> when I yeah. did that book. You know, and it's just about perfecting them. I think for first person, I would not do, I don't think I would do any of the European accents 
as a first person narration because I think first person needs to be really, really perfect because the minute you drop out of the accent, the listener doesn't believe you anymore. If it's third person or it's a secondary character, I feel super comfortable with that. You know, mm-hmm. if, the, if the main narration is with my own accent or even a Southern accent or Canadian or something that's, you know, I'm a bit more comfortable. I wouldn't do, you know, a first person book in Irish, for example. I just don't feel it's perfected enough for that. But secondary characters and even lead characters, you know, in the third person, I think I'm, I'm fine with. And, I, you know, I'm probably going to mark that on my resume to say like, hey, this is secondary characters or things like that, because I think it's really important for authors to know uh, when they're, you know, looking at your stuff too on your website or anything like that. But yeah, you just work on them. I just did a historical romance that had German, Hungarian, Swedish, uh, British, like all sorts of things. And I, I didn't do the Swedish because I was <laughs> very, very nervous. I was going to sound like the Swedish chef from the Muppets. You know? <laughs> And so I leaned more into like transatlantic, like Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn, you know, Catherine Hepburn for that kind of thing, which the when author- When you talk was, like this. Yeah, where everything's <laughs> very exaggerated and, you know, and enunciated and it's good afternoon, and, you know, um, but it worked for that book. It takes place in the 1940s, you know, so it worked. And I was like, otherwise everyone's going to sound British. And so I really wanted to differentiate. And the author, luckily I had a line of communication with the author and she was super happy with that. Um, But yeah, you'd have to perfect it. You know, I know people who get accents in books and they just hire a coach for that accent to make sure they have it, you know, perfected for the book. How do you like mentally stay in the mind of I am reading as a Spanish, I'm, I am reading with a Spanish accent and like not drop out of it, if that makes sense. You know, it's just, again, takes practice and being in the in the mind of the character, too, if they mm-hmm. are a Spaniard or they're from France or, you know, Germany or whatever, they they have a different way in the way they speak, the way they hold themselves and everything. So the more you can get into the character, I definitely think that helps stay in the accent. Um so yeah, that's that's really it. Like in these characters I was just doing, you know, I just was picturing the guy, the way he was leaning and the way he was like smoking a cigarette and, you know, he's speaking with a little bit of a German accent. And I just had this whole visual of his body language going into it, which really was helpful. You know, what's really funny, Monica, is that um, I'm Norwegian, uh, mm-hmm. Norwegian American, but, um, and we went, my husband and I went to Norway and visited some friends and found my grandmother's birthplace um, oh a few God, years ago. Amazing. Yeah. And which was an amazing trip. I, it was just, it was magical. Um, but um, so we visited some friends of mine uh, who live in this t- close to the Southern tip of Norway. And my friend, Christina's husband, Anders picked us up and he's this giant bear of a man, right? Big red beard, bald head. He's like six, five. And he, and he will tell you he's a weaker. Um, which is, he's, he's, he's a priest. He's a, he's a vicar. And um, when he picked us up at the train station, he's like, and first we go to the parking house <laughs> and because he couldn't remember the word for garage. Um, and he was, and at one point they have this, this chain of stores in Norway. It's, they're kind of, they're a little bit um, very uh, touristy, uh, but they're nice, high quality, quality touristy stuff. So if you're there and you want to get gifts for your family, you go there. And it's and it's called. And I, I said something to him about, you know, so what's this Husenflüde? And he he looks at me. He goes Husenflüde. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure you can go too far. Is yeah. my point <laughs> when you're doing a Scandinavian accent? Because <laughs> I was trying really hard to like not be. Like not be um, like I was mocking his accent or anything like that. I was really holding back because, you know, my memory of my grandmother's accent is is sadly kind of almost faded. She had a beautiful speaking voice. But yeah, it was just it was so funny because it was just he he looked at me and he just leaned into that accent. And I was just like, Anders, I love you so much. You're it's such a amazing, goofball. It's an amazing accent, but that is not one that I do well, <laughs> you know? And that's why I was like, I didn't even want to go there because I was like, I just, A, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> and, right. <laughs> um, and, you know, these characters in this particular book, you know, 
the lead character is Swedish, but she's been in America. She's a famous actress, so she has no accent. But then a lot of the people in where it takes place in Sweden also speak very good, you know, English as as well. So I wanted to, you know, find that happy medium. But again, with the accents, I know people who get books who didn't, you know, a, a friend of mine just did a book and there was a, um, gosh, what was it? I think it was a Haitian accent or something that she just did not know. And, and you know, again, she just got coaching on it and, uh, you know, did a great job. I think she just got an amazing review for it too. So Wow. Yeah. Well, so like, for instance, when you, you have the first book in the Center Stage series, Acting Up, you get that book. How long does it take for you to narrate it? Like, are you, are you given like a time frame? Like, Hey, Monica, yes. you have a week to do this. Like how yes. long does it take you? Well, they, they usually, depending on the, you know, publisher, they will say, sometimes they will ask you like, when can you do it? It needs to be done by this date. Like, do you have a space in your schedule? And then you can give them a time frame. I like to give myself plenty of time because otherwise, you know, being in the booth, you know, morning till night can be very bad on your mental health. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and also vocal quality and things like that. You still want to have energy when you're doing the book. So I try to give myself plenty of time if, if the schedule allows for it. And because I've also had where I started to get sick at the end of recording a book, none of Adele's books, (laughs) (laughs) but started to get sick at the end of narrating a book and had to ask for a couple of days, which you know, is not great. They have very strict schedules. Their schedules are super important in terms of when they're releasing the audiobook. And, you know, so again, giving yourself plenty of time for not only for the prep, you have to read the book. I do a pretty extensive prep, meaning, you know, I do synopsis of each of the chapters. I write down all the characters, who they are, what their personality traits are in the book. How are they described in the book by themselves and other people and the author? Um, And then that kind of helps you develop their personality in the book. And also, you know, you have to look up any words that might be, you know, difficult to pronounce or things that you don't know. Or, for example, the book I just did, it was like a ton of Swedish words and Swedish names and things like that. So you have to make sure you have all of that so you're not doing it on the fly because otherwise it A, takes you out of the narration if you come upon a word when you're in the middle of narrating that you don't know and have to stop and look it up you know, especially if you're in a flow of going. So, you know, depending on the book and how difficult it is, the language, things like that, I think it could take anywhere, you know, anywhere between two to one really per finished hour. Like meaning it could take you three hours in the booth to get one finished hour of, mm-hmm. of narration. Um, and, and that's what Julia Whalen says too. I've just recently listened to her on a, a different podcast and that's, that's, that's the ratio she, she pegged it to as well. Yeah. And I think it just depends. Like, you know, I've done some nonfiction books that definitely took me longer because the language was just not how we speak. You know, I just did something that was a, written by a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, beautifully written, very hard, it, you know, just not how we speak normally. And so to try and make that sound, uh, conversational in some ways was very difficult and it took a long time. And so, you know, like I said, I think that's the average is is in there. Some books can take longer. Some books can take a lot shorter than that too, depending on the prep. And then there are people who you can actually hire to do the prep for you as well. Really? Yeah. If you, you know, are really booked up as a narrator and don't have time to do that, you can, there are people who are professional audiobook preppers who will do all of that for you too. I still think it's important for the narrator to read the book, even if it's a quick skim, you know, so they get a feel for it rather than just going straight off of the prep. But I know people who've done it and, you know, they're very experienced narrators too, who do that, who can do that. Um, but yeah, I, I've so far only had prep done on one book and I've prepped everything else myself. Well, I think especially like reading audio, like doing romance audio, I think that prep can be important because do you remember, I would just love to hear your first time having to read a sex scene. Like <laughs> anybody that's coming into this space that wants to like narrate audio for romance, I do think that that's something that you have to be prepared for. So 100%. how was that for you? And like, what advice do you have? Well, it, well, it's got to be real. I mean, to, you know, Adele's point, Tanya just did this article 
Um, and I'm sure she talks about it in the article. You know, the first time you read those words out loud, like you, you, kind of say, you can't help but laugh a little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, wait, I just said what? Um, We're all still like that tween girl is still in all of us. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because, you know, that's something that I love about romance. But let's normalize. Yeah these words and normalize talking about sex because it isn't something to be ashamed of or embarrassed about. And I think that's another thing I love about romance and erotica is that it normalizing, you know, talking about this stuff, asking for what you want, you know, being open and not embarrassed and, you know, all of those things. But yes, the first time I read a sex scene out loud, I was like, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I actually stopped, I like went back. I mean, obviously I had prepped the book, but I went back to those scenes and sort of practiced it, reading it out loud because I was like, this has got to sound real mm -hmm. and authentic to the listener. So they're experiencing it as a real sex scene. Yeah, I think it's really important to, and you know, now I feel like that's, I love, I actually love narrating sex scenes. I think they're really fun. <laughs> Excellent. You know, one of us. One of us. <laughs> yeah, I think they're really fun. And, I, you know, like I said earlier, just to start, I think they're very important. I think they're very important uh, for women, especially to just, you know, like I said, just it's normalizing that language, normalizing, you know, talking about sex, saying the things that you want, that you need, the things that make you happy, the things that bring you joy, especially in the bedroom and, you know, outside of it, too. And we're socialized so much to not do that. I think that's obviously changed a lot uh, recently. But, you know, if you're in that late 40s, 50s, you know, and beyond, it, it wasn't. And I think it's really important. And so, yeah, I hope I do those scenes justice. And, you know, there's always work to be done to become better at it. Um, but I think those scenes are very important and vital to those books, 100% vital. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For, for, for both of you, like, um, I feel like I'm really happy that, these books are available on audio. I I feel like um I don't see much romance set in the world of theater or movies coming out. And it, it you'll get a sprinkle here and there. And when it when they come out, I feel like it's a big deal. Um, why like Adele with you being an author and and Monica with you narrating? <clears throat> what is it about romance in the world of like theater and movies? Like why don't we see more of it why aren't we seeing more of it especially I feel like coming from pandemic where like I feel like people were like binging shows and binging movies it's like obviously people are interested in this world why aren't we seeing more of it on the page well I can tell you right off in terms of traditional publishing that um, acting up was the book that got me my first agent mm -hmm. and we could not sell that book and fully 50 percent of the editors that we tried to sell to sell the series to uh, said theater books don't sell. <laughs> and it was just like, I, I, I mean, love the, they, the don't sell. Like, how do you know they're not going to sell if you don't? Well, and, it out? Uh, <laughs> there is that, but then there's also, did you see how wildly popular Lucy Parker is? Mm -hmm. And why is there only one Lucy Parker? And why, why, I mean, it's, it's really funny because there's this strange dichotomy in a lot of industries, but I think publishing is really one of them, is they, they say, oh, this is selling really well. We want more of this. Well, at the same time, treating that thing like it's Highlander, there can be only one. There can be only one. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset that's baffling to me. So I think that's why, you know, the, the series has been, especially, especially acting up, has been you know, rather popular with, with readers. And, you know, one of the things I tried to do with selling it was, look, hey, former theater kids, and I know there are thousands upon thousands of us. These books are for you. Yeah. Oh, it just burns me up because I feel like even in the world of like education, the arts is always like the first to go. And it just feels mm -hmm. like, why, why don't we see more books set in the world of the arts? You know, uh, what do you think, Monica? I agree. Well, that's why I just loved these books so much because it was my world. You know, it made sense to me because when you're, you know, in prior to the pandemic, right, I'm surrounded by actors, surrounded by the entertainment industry. So that is where you're meeting people. That is where you're meeting people that you're dating and things like that. So that makes sense to me. And I think it's so interesting. You know, it's 
agents across the board will say, well, that doesn't sell or your brand doesn't sell or, you know, to Adele's point, nothing in the theater world sells, which, you know, doesn't make sense because there's a lot of people in the entertainment industry and there's a ton of people interested in the entertainment industry, even if they're not in it. And Mm -hmm. so learning about that world, I think a ton of people would be interested in it. I loved these books because to me, it was very accurate. Um, especially the second book. And I know Adele and I have talked <laughs> about this, the second book, Method Acting. Um, I so really related to Alicia because especially, you know, as you age in the acting world, she has, she had a couple lines and Adele, maybe you can remind me, but where <laughs> I just, I so got it. It was so in my bones when I said those lines, when I narrated those, those lines, because she's talking about aging and about how we we sort of age out. I mean, things are changing a bit. And as I've gotten older now, I'm getting better roles, which is interesting because when I was in my 20s and 30s, those roles weren't available for women, you know, in their 40s and 50s. And now they are. I think they're finally getting that, like, we're not out to pasture at this age and we have a lot to offer. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she's ta- she talks about that in the book so accurately. And I was emotional when I was reading those lines because and I could I hear it. And I and I actually messaged her. I was like, oh, my God, you nailed that. You absolutely nailed that. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's, you know, to your to Adele's point, Lucy Parker's the only one that I know really in the romance genre who sets who has some books set in the entertainment industry and theater and things like that. But that's what I loved about Adele's because you actually went not only theater, you went film, TV, you know, and, and, and people working in it too, not just people who were actually performing, but people working in those arenas too. And I thought that was fascinating. Well, that was, that was kind of the, the impetus for, for the, the whole, the whole series, but acting up specifically, I realized that I had seen books set in the entertainment industry and they always always, always start actors. And, you know, you know, I love me an actor, Um, (laughs) but I was like, why don't we ever see it from any other point of view? And so that's why I wanted those protagonists to be the director and stage manager, Um, because you, you see all the behind the scenes stuff. And the other thing I wanted to do in the scaffold of that book was it starts in the audition room and it ends on opening night. So you kind of have the entire arc, not only of their relationship, but how do you build a production? And all the people Um, involved. and All the people involved and all the relationships you have with with all the people involved because you've worked with them on different projects and you you know them a little, maybe a little too well. Um, (laughs) And uh, and the the other thing I wanted to do with that book, which is, which is weird, but the two like creative inspirations for that, for that book specifically were Jane Austen's Lady Susan. Um, yeah. which it's, it's an absolute homage to Lady Susan. And that's why at the end of most chapters, there is a, there's a, a email exchange between Susan and Alicia mm-hmm. because Lady Susan is an epistolary novel. And the other, um, the other really strong inspiration was the Canadian workplace comedy Slings and Arrows. Oh, no way. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Paul is, first of all, he, he's named Paul because Paul Gross, the lead, and he was explicitly modeled in my head on Paul Gross in that show with the crazy, messy hair and the kind of slightly distracted but brilliant way about him and, you know, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. I mean, I felt and you know, I just felt that the characters were so clear to me and even how you'd written them. There wasn't a whole lot of questioning on my part of like who this person is. So... I felt it was brilliantly done. And obviously the the scene, the setups were so accurate, like I've said before. And throughout all of them is very accurate in how how people behave, how productions are done, you know, how the system works. And yeah, it was it was just such a joy. So I would love to hear like what both of you are working on now. Like Adele, I know you'll be having some books coming out. Um, (laughs) What are you currently working on? And then Monica, like what are you going to be narrating for us next? Okay. um, So I just handed in developmental edits um, for the book that we talked about the last time I was on the podcast, which was, I was, I was hoping it would be titled in a hot minute. Uh, and I know that you love that title, but it has a new title that the marketing department at Harlequin came up with, and it's called Fake Flame. 
which I'm not actually, mad at it. Okay. I'm not mad at it either. I like it. I love I it. Really, I really like it. And the, the other thing that we talked about last time was that, um, you know, when you're a self-published author, you know, you get all the creative control, but you also have to do all the things. So I was, I, Monica and I chatted briefly yesterday, just so we had like a little bit of a, you know, sense of, of each other uh, beyond, you know, DMs on Instagram and emails. Um, but um, the other thing that, that is, is out now, we don't have a cover yet, but I've seen some, some, some conceptual stuff. We've had some discussions. So it's very, very exciting. Um, the other thing is that somebody at Harlequin wrote the most brilliant back cover copy that I did not, A, did not have to write myself, did not even have any input on. And it also sounds like my book. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> that sounded brilliant. So yeah, that's really exciting. Brilliant. And so I'm working on the second book in that series now. I'm draft working on drafting it. I'm sort of colloquially calling it the, you know, either the chaos novel or the disaster novel because it's not about a disaster. But I, I feel like, you know, sometimes when you have a really great experience writing a book, like the next book is like, as as we as authors like to say, what are words? <laughs> like What's going? How do I yeah. write? How do I write book? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so this one is um, so the book one. Sean is a the, the male protagonist is a firefighter and he has a colleague on the on the squad. Thea, uh, female uh, colleague, and um, Thea is in the process of changing her career. She is not going to be a firefighter anymore because reasons, spoilery reasons. Um, and she's becoming a social media manager for the, the county's fire and rescue service. And she is placed with the county library's social media manager, who is somebody that she went to high school with who had a crush on her, and she does not remember him. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and then as one of my former critique partners would say, um, many, many adventures later. <laughs> dot 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 because <laughs> it's chaos book so i'm drafting that i'll be getting uh copy edits um for fake flame back at some point we'll have a cover for fake flame at some point and by the time this comes out the name of the um the name of the line will actually have been released because it's been a it's been a it's been a very hush hush thing for a really long time harlequin did away with their desire line and they started this new line they they kept calling it new sexy contemporary um which is like as i as abigail kelly and i said it's like well it is what what it says on the tin um but it doesn't really sound like a harlequin line either and um and abigail i know that you and you and aaron had a whole like mini podcast about like what could it possibly be called and um and abigail decided she was going to start calling it harlequin anonymous <laughs> Love it. We just so, have this whole list of what it's not going to be called, but like we exactly. didn't know what it was going to be called. And I asked John when they came on, I'm like, can we please get some of these new books on audio? And I feel like Monica has to narrate them. I mean, <laughs> I, yes, she does. I literally, I would narrate romance every single day of the week. I, <laughs> I really do. And it's funny because I've stepped out of it the last couple of books. And I was like, I really just want to, I have a few other books lined up, but I'm like, I really want to just fill with, with some fun romance. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun to narrate. It really is. So what are you going to be narrating? Like, what are you working on? Monica? Well, I just wrapped a really cool um, literary fiction book called All Night Pharmacy, which is sort of a David Lynch meets Rachel Kushner fever dream. It, it all takes place in LA about these two sisters kind of drug fueled nights in Los Angeles and then chaos happens. So not a romance book, but a really <laughs> fun, interesting book that I, it, I was, I was really excited about narrating this book. It was very interesting. Um, and then I actually just did a nonfiction uh, just wrapped this about a week ago called Queen of the Court, The Many Lives of Tennis Legend Alice Marble, which is really cool. Um, I don't know if you guys know too much about Alice Marble, but she's kind of one of the first really worldwide celebrity tennis we oh, know wow. uh, women tennis players so that was really interesting but i just did a dual um a two book mafia romance under my pseudonym and uh i have a few more books coming under my pseudonym which are really fun and i have a uh paranormal one a paranormal romance oh. coming up too so. 
<laughs> kind of all over the board, but literally would fill my slate any day of the week with with romance. So I'm excited about the Mafia romances coming out and the next paranormal romance. And then I've got a few more that I'm in line for. So hopefully those come through. And um, yeah, we'll see. Kind of all over the board. But like I said, romance is where my heart is. <laughs> So I have to ask, since I have two, like, you know, theater film lovers here, you know, it's the summer, like, what is giving, okay, besides like writing for you, Adele, and besides (laughs) narrating for you, Monica, like, when you all have your time at the end of the day to just wind down, like, what has been giving you life this summer? Like, what have you been enjoying? Oh my goodness. Well, for me, it's, it's just the sun, the sun has, is out. I live in Venice beach, so I'm in California and it's been gorgeous. So really just like, I've been back on my bicycle. Um, a girlfriend of mine, not myself, we got back on roller skates. Oh, so, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we've been doing the roller skating thing. There's an outdoor rink near her house. And so we've been getting on our roller skates, practicing our spins and, and it's been so fun and hiking And things like that, just, you know, outdoor stuff. I'm such, I love the outdoors. And so that's really where I get filled up, I find. And so that's been a lot of it, like just morning walks to the beach, hiking in the afternoon, you know, getting in the water and uh, things, things like that. What about you, Adele? It's so funny because I think Monica and I have so much in common and we could not come from more different areas of the world <laughs> uh, because I am, uh, while I live, have lived in the Washington DC area for over 20 years now, uh, I am, I'm, I am a New Englander to the core. I am from New Hampshire. And so what happens in Washington DC is it, we descend into absolute humidity soup this time of year. Uh, so as much as I do normally love going outside, I do not love it when I feel like I am gargling the air. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, we still do get outside and, and I, you know, I'm still exercising and, do, you know, doing all those things that I need to do to keep this silly thing that carries my brain around healthy. Um, but as per the usual, I, my husband and I can be found at a local winery, um, because that's our happy place and it's kind of our standing weekly date. And we have our little, we have our little, um, so we call it silent book club or we meet, we meet up with friends like Jace Ellis and her husband were, you know, the four of us are very close and we I love we'll that. see them about once a month. Um, yeah, if you, Jace Ellis's books, Monica, I think you'd love them. They're great. Um, Brie, have you, have, I shouldn't put you on the spot, but anyway, <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, in terms of entertainment, I am one of these people who is absolutely gagging to see the Barbie movie, even though I'll probably yeah. still wait until it comes out on streaming because movie theaters these days, you know, just, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like it's going to be packed. It's going to be so packed. So packed. And I'm still one of those people who like, I'm, I still mask on the train because my husband has some health issues that I want to mm-hmm. protect him and, and all of that. So the idea of going and, 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 you know, masking up and going to the movies is not as attractive as being able to sit in my comfortable living room and, you know, feeling able to pause it if I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I love that. But don't you but, just um, miss going to the movies, though? I just miss going to the movies. I, I kind of do. But I mean, my husband and I, we were even even at the best of times, we were like, maybe go to the movies once a year types. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just I'm not even sure how how it changed. I don't know it. I don't know. I, I yeah. I, I don't know. But I, I used to be a little bit more of a of a movie goer. Like when I was in law school in the '90s, we had a you know one of those second run dollar movie theaters, and so you know even for a broke law student, that was some place we, yeah. we could go. <laughs> this is this is something my husband and I kind of like go blow for blow. I guess it, like deep conversation. I'm like. You, because he's such a at home binger, and I'm like, I miss the experience of either going to the movies or going to Blockbuster and renting movies. I'm like, it was a whole experience that I just feel like, yeah, it's great to like sit home and binge a show, but it just feels like I'm missing something. The ritual, <laughs> it's a ritual. Yeah. yeah, well, and it can be, it can be weirdly difficult to try to like keep track of like what is where on various streaming services and you know it's like it's like I'm waiting for somebody to to reprogram our tv so that basically it reinvents TiVo so I basically (laughs) I can have like all of the things that I want to see in like one interface rather than bopping between all these things I I I understand that I set now sound 
positively ancient, but <laughs> it's, it's really, it really, it really does like, because we'll, we'll start watching something. And then if like something else, like, so like when we'll start watching something that maybe is like on Netflix and it's all available all at once and we're kind of, kind of into it, we're, we're enjoying it. And then something else that is only, you know, is, is being released on a drip, like say Abbott Elementary or Ted Lasso or something like that comes in and we're like, oh, we get to watch that. And it kind of like derails us. We don't, we're not like watching another episode of that every night. And it kind of just falls off our plate. I um, wait until it gets all released. And then- <laughs> <laughs> like, I just don't, I can't do the drip anymore. I was like, just wait till it's all out. <laughs> but, but to your point, Brie, like I miss the experience of going to a movie theater. Like I already have a date set up with a friend of mine where we're going to go see Dune when it comes out, like Mm -hmm. on IMAX, like in the theater, like do the whole experience thing. So yeah, I do miss it, but I, I, I get it. Things that, you know, we have a new normal now since the pandemic. And the thing that's interesting to your point, Adele, like I still wear a mask on the airplane and stuff because looking back way before the pandemic, I cannot tell you how many times I got sick after taking a flight. Yeah. And I was like, why weren't we doing this all the time? Like, it just sort of makes sense to me. It you made know. you realize how gross we were. Like, every time mm-hmm. I pump, like, I'm, I'm a, I keep wipes in my purse because now I'm like, I can't imagine. All the times I used to just touch the gas pump. Oh, yeah. Pump gas. <laughs> Golly. Touching, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everything. I do the same thing. I do the same thing. <laughs> so I get it. But yes, I love the wine dates to Adele. We do that. That's so um, sweet. Me and a bunch of my girlfriends and, you know, everyone's partners and husbands and whatnot. Like we get together and we do dinner nights quite a lot, like where we just do collaborative cooking and Mm -hmm. drink wine and sit outside and things like that. And it's just, it's just nice to be with friends, you know, and I think that's something that a lot of people still are trying to figure out since the pandemic is how to hang out, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's, that was the lucky thing about, about having this winery. And first, first of all, it's like, you know, as somebody who, who likes good wine, it's, it's also a really, really good, like, has a good product. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's a nice thing. And then they have, they have food trucks that come on a rotation. Uh, and so you, you know, you go and you can have a meal and, and, you know, even at the height of the pandemic, you could sit outside, Yeah, you know, and you, you, you mask up to go into the tasting room, you get your bottle, you, you come out, you can take your mask off, you can sit outside with your friends, be relatively safe, you know, get your food from the food truck, be all open air, be, be healthy. And so it was kind of like, of course, it closed down for a few months when, you know, it, when things were really, really, you know, at the beginning and everything was just closing uh, practically. But um, it was pretty, pretty quickly able to reopen and, uh, do, you know, have because they have tons of outside space, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And so we, we were just like, oh, this this little gem in our lives doesn't have to change very much. <laughs> what about you? What about you, Brie? What's what's your thing that you're doing this summer? going for more walks. I, I fell in love with going for walks this, like this spring, really. Uh, I had never really been a walker. I've always been like an early morning runner. Uh, and I just really, I realized the way that my neighborhood is designed, it has quite a few straightaways that like down and back is like 30 minutes, you know, kind of going both ways. And I really, fallen in love with it it's perfect audiobook time it's perfect podcast listening time <laughs> it's also just my husband and I talking and laughing the whole time so uh, I think that's been it it's been and I love the morning walks <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. kind of like yeah, listening to you Adele it's like I realized how much I wanted to be outside I just wanted to be outside so it's been great. And it is such a perfect time to listen to audiobooks and podcasts and by the way as you know for women, as we get older too, like running and really hard exercise is very hard on our bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, especially if you deal with a lot of stress and you have adrenal stuff, like hard cardio and things like that is actually not great for you anymore as you get older. So even just doing walks is actually so great for you. It's so So, much nicer. Yeah. It's just, it's really, it's, it's healthier. It's calming. It's more calming on your nervous system and allows your body to relax more. So if you are you know, doing anything to try and get in shape. It's kind of the perfect thing to do. Well, I have some very random 
Adele, you know, I like to round us out with some like random questions. Y'all just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Like don't think too much into it. So first one, I feel like summer is like the season of nostalgia. I don't know why. Both of y'all tell me like one of your favorite summer memories. Oh, the lake. (laughs) Um, Well, I could tell you a recent one. I was in, yeah, Lake Tahoe. uh, I was in Lake Tahoe. This was last summer. And uh, with a bunch of friends who knew a bunch of people and one of my friend's boyfriends uh, had a friend who had a boat. So we were able to go out in the middle of Lake Tahoe and go to this like private beach on the other side of Lake Tahoe. And it was just all of us like really good friends drinking rosé, like having some food, swimming all day. And, you know, it was just paddleboarding. It was just the most fun. And just being outside in that beautiful water surrounding, yeah, stuff like that. That's, I remember, I remember it so clearly. The water was just, just amazing. And it was, again, just that time of being with good friends and enjoying being together and laughing and being outside and enjoying such a beautiful place as Lake Tahoe. So mm-hmm. I'm from Northern California originally, so I'm, I'm a Tahoe girl. So anytime I get to go back, it's really heartwarming for me. What about you, Adele? Mine is also a lake, mm-hmm. a very, very much smaller lake um, at, in my hometown in New Hampshire. And, and it was a, a lake that my, my parents used to take me to when I was a little kid. And I was one of those little kids who was just like, he just like, drag me out for for meals make me sit still for you know the 20 minutes or whatever it was supposed to be so you didn't get the bends you know and and then just like I'm just in the water the entire time (laughs) you know unless there's a a weird water snake that which that happened to me once I was swimming and I look over and there's this it was a harmless snake but I am absolutely phobic about snakes and so my father likes to say that he 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 now knows his daughter can walk on water (laughs) Because of how <laughs> fast I exited that water, oh, uh, yeah. you know, from seeing this, the snakes, you know, because New Hampshire does have timber rattlers, but, you know, I've never seen one. Um, and so, you know, all of our snakes were, were benign, but, you know, tell that to my, tell that to my hind brain yeah. is, is having none of it. Oh, I would have, I would have jumped out of that too. So. <laughs> One like slithered into my driveway one day. And it, the bad thing is, is that I, I walked out of the door and I, I heard it. It's the grossest sound I've ever heard in my life. I'm sorry to the snake lovers out there. I saw one on my hike the other day. It was a rattlesnake too. Oh God. Um, but I mean, luckily it was just kind of like, I saw it far, you know, it was kind of just cruising across the path, going to the mm-hmm. other side. And from what I know, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I believe they can't really bite you unless they're coiled because they have to be able to spring at you. So if they're like laid out flat, they'd really have to coil up pretty quick to get you. So I just kind of waited till he got to, yeah, I waited till he got to the other side and then just cruised by rather briskly. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that would not be something I would care to test. Oh my gosh. But yeah, so we we have, we have copperheads down here. So we, I, you know, I have to be, I have to, I keep an eye out. Well, the next two questions that I have for y'all are music questions. So tell me the last song that got stuck in your head. Oh, gosh. I usually have a constant earworm. But <laughs> um, it was probably it was no surprise from the last time. I'm pretty sure it was a Brandy Carlisle song, but I can't remember which one. Okay. Okay. Uh, the last, oh, gosh, it was probably on my hike. It was a Billie Eilish song. Uh, I'm Not Your Friend, I believe it is. Mm. <laughs> It's, it's she, oh, I love Billy. I love Billy Eilish. <laughs> I don't know what 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 what's happened, but I don't even know. I think I was in the grocery store. I get a lot of my Shazam or like, oh, I forgot about this song moments in the grocery store. Um, Come Together by the Beatles has been oh, like yeah. my summer song. <laughs> and That's a great song. That's a great I song to get it. stuck in your head. Yeah. Okay, this one might be tough, but. I would love to hear from both of you. Tell me one of the most romantic songs you've ever heard, or just a song that you think is truly romantic. Hmm, hmm. that is a tough one. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to go to the Brandy Carlisle well again. I'm sorry, uh, and I'm gonna, <laughs> and I'm gonna go with with you and me on the rock mm-hmm. because for a lot of reasons. Because first of all, it is this is a song where my husband keeps forgetting he asked this question and asking me again and say, saying. This is a this is a Joni Mitchell cover, right? No, honey, no, no, 
No, it's not. It, it sounds like it's supposed to sound like Joni Mitchell because Brandy Carlisle is a great admirer of Joni Mitchell and a great friend of Joni Mitchell, but it's not. But also that uh, Brandy in her latest, she has this great concert thing that's out on uh, HBO and she performs it with her wife and they're just so dear, the two of them. It's just, it's sweet. Love that. What about you, Monica? Anything come to mind? I'm like really trying to think. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think I listen to a lot of love songs, honestly. I think that's part of the problem. Um, gosh, what was the last one? I'm trying to think what was on my like uh, Spotify as I was hiking, and I would probably say, oh, you know who? Well, what's the one? There's a new one by Sam Smith that I really liked that features Ed Sheeran. Oh, his called, voice is so beautiful. Yeah, I think it's called "Who We Love," mm-hmm. um, which is just, I mean, just is such a good message too in general. Um, I think that was the last one I listened to that I really dug. I feel like Sam Smith is such a a hidden gem. I don't know. I, I his want... voice is amazing. <laughs> it's his gorgeous. voice is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me the last show, series, whatever, like the last thing you binged on film. Oh my gosh. I re-binged. And this goes to the romance thing is I love paranormal romance too. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I re-binged True Blood. Ooh. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Charlene Harris. That takes me back. Yeah. Um, geez, what did this last thing? I mean, I think the last thing that we binged, like seriously binged, um, was we re-binged the first two seasons of Ted Lasso to prepare ourselves for, for season the three. end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, lastly, tell me an unforgettable movie theater scene that you'll never get out of your head (laughs) oh my god I'm going to tell you the first thing that just flashed in my head was Brad Pitt riding his horse in Legends of the Fall when he (laughs) first appears on scene when he rides up and his hair is blowing in the wind I remember (laughs) the entire theater it was like a collective gasp (laughs) such a dreamboat oh my gosh everyone was like (gasps) oh Oh yeah, when he when he first appeared, I think it wasn't the first movie he was in. Thelma and Louise, though. That was the first. Uh, that was his first big movie. Yes, big then, movie. Yeah, and I remember be- oh. being in the movie theater and seeing him for the first time and going, "Holy cow!" Yes, but okay. he'd, grown, he'd grown up a little bit in Legends of yeah. the Fall, like he as he oh, got sure. older. And oh my god, I just remember that scene so well. It's like riding up over the hill <laughs> on the horseback and his hair flying in the wind. Yes, that is amazing. Scene. Yes, that's I will not forget that scene. <laughs> and and for me, it's it's weird because um, the the movie is very much almost not about about it, despite it being in the title. Uh, it's it's the wedding scene in Monsoon Wedding, um, which is a Mira Nair film. Uh, oh, I love it's her. S- set in India. It's one of my favorite movies. And when when Mr. B and I got married, uh, it was our favorite movie of that year. And of course, it poured during our wedding, our outdoor wedding. Oh, God. <laughs> um, and we, we, we said, we said, well, I guess it was our fault for loving this movie so much. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that entire movie is so much, it's, it's not really about marriage at all. It's not about weddings. It's about family and, 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 you know, sorting things out and it's just a wonderful film, but, um, but yeah, the, the wedding scene itself, and of course it does rain, it pours, uh, and there's so much sort of joy and resolution, um, that uh, I just uh, it is so be- beautiful, colorful, beautiful. Oh, all so. of her, yeah, her stuff is phenomenal. That that movie, yeah. I agree with you. It is so beautifully done. Um, and, and okay, I'm gonna throw one more in here. I promise. So, and then I'll I'll let you <laughs> enjoy the rest <laughs> of Saturday. So, you know, in this part of the world, it's it's summertime. I know our friends on the other side of the world. It's a totally different season. But you know, for all of our our listeners and the world has been crazy um to be taking care of ourselves what should, what's one thing both of you would advise that we not be doing i would love to say like what should we be doing but i think you know let's let's hmm. let's flip it what's one thing we should not be doing whether it's don't wake up and get on social media you know first thing or whatever first thing that you can think of uh, that would be one of mine is is don't lock yourself indoors. Like even if it's, you know, getting outside is so important. So, you know, <laughs> that's what, it, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a health and certified health and life coach. Mm-hmm. So the the not getting up and immediately getting on social media is a huge thing. Uh, that's a no, no. 
you know, is allowing yourself to, to wake up, take some deep belly breaths, maybe even set an intention for your day, drink a big glass of water. Don't immediately grab your phone you know, and start scrolling. Because think about like when you're in that sort of sleep and in-between state, you know, um, our brain is really susceptible. So when falling asleep, I always say, don't be on TV, don't be on telephone, don't be, you know, on social media and all that kind of stuff. And the same with waking up. I love that. I actually read somewhere that like uh, uh, reading your affirmations, like right before bedtime is actually like one of the best times to do it. Yeah. Like I said, that in-between state when you're just going to bed and when you're just waking up, uh, we're very susceptible. So it's actually the best time to meditate, the best time to set intentions and things like that too. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Adele, what should we not be doing? I w- I'm going to go less for the physical and more for the mental. And that is, it, it's, don't listen to your jerk brain. <laughs> when your brain is being a Love jerk. It. And telling you, you know, and say, and say, insisting that your imposter syndrome is is really in the right of it, and all of that. Don't listen to it. Yep, your mean girl. <laughs> yep, your inner mean girl. Oh, we need that on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my some some friends of mine uh, years ago um, coined the the term jerk brain, and I, I just I love it for uh, it's such a it's such a sort of a, a minimizing way to think about negative self talk. Love and it. It's, it. Putting it in its place. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I always say, you know, the way we talk to ourselves, oh my gosh, if we talk to other people that way, can you imagine if you said that stuff to your best friend or right. your family? Like we would have no friends. <laughs> and most of us it's, would it, admit that we wouldn't talk to our best friend like that. Exactly. So why do we, you know, we allow ourselves to do that to ourselves and it's so self-defeating. So yeah, it, I, that's a is. great one, Adele. That is a great one. Well, it is. And I want to, there's a, there's a sort of a, a micro trope that I love to see in books is when somebody is being, you know, one of characters being down on themselves and then another character, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's the romantic um, partner or whatever. That other person says, don't talk about my friend that way. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love I that. Love that. Yeah. So Monica, how do we tell the mean, the inner mean girl to be quiet? You know, a lot of times it's actually just acknowledging it. I think some people don't even know that it's there. You know, they're so used to it running the show. I call sort of that, uh, the mean, the inner mean girl, I call them usually it's the background dancers, but a lot of times the background dancers are running the show. (laughs) So it's also (laughs) first acknowledging, like, there's a little thing that I have my clients do. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but sometimes just when you set an intention, right? Like I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, like what comes up for you? What are the words that all of a sudden your brain starts going? You might be very surprised (laughs) by what that inner mean girl has to say and acknowledging that it's there. And then, you know, I also say, is it true? Mm -hmm. Is what it's saying true? And, you know, yeah, may, we might be able to find some examples, but for the most part, no, it's not true. Like, can I prove that this is true? No, you can't because it's not true. It's made up. It's coming from our place of fear. And, you know, that is really there just to keep us safe. And so acknowledging it, say, hey, thank you. I know you're trying to keep me safe, but I got it. I got it. Yeah. And so it's like having the fear and doing it anyway, right? I got this. Thank you for keeping me safe. I know that that's why you're there, but I'm going to do this. And I, and I got it. I got it. This is so awesome. Okay, Adele, where yeah. should everyone be keeping up with you online? <laughs> well, um, you know, in these in these waning days of Twitter, I'm still there. <laughs> I'm kind of like riding the ship down just because it's, it's where still most of my friends still are. Uh, I am on Instagram at underscore Adele Buck. I am on Blue Sky, which is, as, as we record now is still invite only, will probably be for, for some time, but um, I'm on there as Adele Buck. Uh, enjoying it for, for for the time being. And of course, I have a website, adelbach.com, and you can sign up for my newsletter, which is a great way of keeping in touch with any author that you're interested in knowing what's going on with them and their, their work and what they're enjoying. So yeah. Monica, where awesome. can everybody keep up with you? Everything uh, online in terms of you know, Instagram, Facebook, it's, you know, at Monica Plant. Uh, I think Facebook might be the real Monica Plant. <laughs> um, <laughs> but my website is is monicaplant.com. And then my pseudonym is kingsleyrosenarrates.com. So those are my two websites. And yeah, Instagram, Facebook, I just joined Threads, which is at Monica Plant. And I, I, I'm I, just getting going on TikTok as a narrator. Ooh. So it'll, yeah. <laughs> 
So everything, luckily, could because my name is spelled a little funky, you know, for the most part, I got at Monica Plant everywhere. <laughs> okay. Well, I will have links to all the places where everyone can keep up with the both of you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. This has been so fun. Um, I'm sorry I didn't realize, like, the, my apologies for taking a lot of your time today, but this was just... <laughs> so much fun. This was so fun. Thank you so much for having me and Adele. I've just been, I've, I'm just so grateful for getting to know you and and being able to voice your words. And I just really appreciate Brie having us on to talk about it. Mm